Hey, y'all. Welcome back to The Inner. Today, I'm joined by my brother, uh, Brandon Marks. Hello. Thank you, Apostle, you for having me. How you doing, Brandon? I'm doing amazing. How about you? I'm doing great. If you could introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. I'm Brandon J. Marks. Um, I'm an energy being. I am the Christ of God. I am that I am. Um, I'm a creative, an artist, a singer, songwriter, a producer. I just, I'm all things creativity and um, I'm me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's up. So I had your mom on here recently. You know, by the time this come out, it ain't going to be like last week or nothing like that. <laughs> but um, I had your mom on recently. I've been trying to get you for forever. Um, by the time I end up wrapping this show up, I've even went and got your whole family on here because y'all, y'all some cool people. <laughs> One of my favorite families that then adopted me. <laughs> wow. We are only a reflection of you. So I thank you for that. Ah. <laughs> so tell us about your story. Where, uh, How did you start out and how did you end up doing what you do now? Sure. Okay. So um, I'm third generation uh, ministry bred. <laughs> um I uh, was raised in the church, of course. Uh, I started preaching at the age of eight and uh, singing, learning worship and ministry, the dynamics of worship in the traditional church system. My parents were youth pastors. My grandparents, of course, were pastors, as you know, my grandmother and uh, my, gran my late grandfather. Um, and so my parents relocated to Houston from Orange, Texas. Um, I guess it was 2005. And so some years later, like 2009, they ended up birthing a ministry um, in the Woodlands, Texas. And so I started youth pastoring at the ministry at 15, um, just learning the, the ropes of ministry and as a leader and moving in leadership. And then I became the executive pastor in I think 2018. Um, and I served with, with my father and my mother um, and so, yeah, now it's 2024, I'm doing worship ministry. Um, but I guess a lot happened in between those years, which I, I'm sure you'll prompt me with questions as to, to how, how the, uh, deconstruction of my faith kind of happened. Um, but that, that was really the starting, uh, part of my journey is, uh, I was, I was born in the, in the church. <laughs> so, okay. So I'm assuming you, like you said, you started out singing when you were a kid, um, did you actually want to sing or were you made to sing at that time? I wanted to. I wanted to sing. Both my parents sing. They led worship. I come from a family of musicians and singers who are, they are extraordinary to this day. And um, so I was, uh, our entire family, like the choir was family. And so I always grew up around that inspiration. So I definitely wanted to be a part of it. I didn't necessarily know that I would do it like full time or as an artist. Um, but I definitely grew into it and I definitely wanted to. Yeah. Cause I remember growing up, uh, there wasn't a necessarily a youth ministry in a lot of churches. It was just the children's choir and they made us get up there. <laughs> right. But that's actually good to hear that there was something you wanted to do at that age. And it turned into be part of your calling. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Let's get into into the uh, I guess you could say the the more fun stuff. So when did your beliefs begin to shift? Sure, uh, I want to say probably about 2016. I well maybe 15, maybe maybe 2015. I did something really weird. Well, I've always been this uh, out of the box type of guy. So I um, when I was youth pastoring, I started this thing called. Um, YSF. It was a youth spring fest. So at, at, we would do a lock in during spring break and we would have kids come. We booked out this 300,000 square foot uh, gym with batting cages. And, and so we'd have a, this whole environment and experience for the kids. But I started real talk sessions. It's when we divided into two different groups, female and male. And we would talk about all of the taboo topics from other religions to sex, to masturbation, like those, I love taboo topics. So I really would say it started in my teenage years that I was so interested in learning what people didn't talk about. Like if you talked about it, I probably wasn't so interested, but I wanted to know about um, the, the mysteries, you know? And so 
that really started it. But then in 2016, I, um, I started Googling about hypnosis, which probably sounds funny. Um, but I was like, you know, I'm really interested. I feel like it's not really far off from what we do. I felt like the church had a lot of mind control anyway. So I was like, if I set my intentions, <laughs> um, I should be fine. Right. So I started like YouTube and videos and I would listen to them basically to kind of gauge if they were safe because I didn't want to like play it and get stuck somewhere, you know? Um, but I ended up trying like two of them and I laid in my bed and I just, I didn't tell anybody. And, uh, I only told one person that was, it was way later after I did it, Dr. Sakrita Sutton, who's a major inspiration and friend to our family. Um, but so I just had this peaking interest. And so I did that and I felt so different. And it was, it was a general hypnosis. It wasn't like, you know, help me off my drugs or anything. It was probably like just to feel joy or just to feel happiness. And when I did that, I was like, okay, okay. But this was demonized. So, but there's truth in this experience. So that was a starting point for me. So from that point on, I started learning about meditation, just learning. And when I first started meditation, it was like, quiet my thoughts, you know, just, I just want to shut my brain off. And I realized that what, that wasn't really the goal necessarily. <laughs> um, so then I learned about breath work. And so a few years passed, like 2018, at this time I'm working in Hollywood. I was living back and forth uh, in, from LA to Houston. Um, and my life had just within a two year span, just skyrocketed in terms of my career. So I was doing marketing for the Oprah Winfrey Network. Um, I had partnerships with Sony Animation. I was, I was just doing any brand that you could think of. It was just coming my way. Um, so I had a really awesome relationship with my manager there, um, that was really connecting me with a lot of things in, in the, in the industry. But I started to notice, for whatever reason, now I know what it is. But at that time, I didn't. L.A. silenced me. Um, I never sang there. I didn't use that. Anyone that knows me knows that that's a, a really big gift of mine, music. I never sang. Um, and I was around some of the greatest and I just folded. Then I noticed there was a lot of religious ideals that I had and a lot of religious perspectives, but they weren't necessarily spiritual. And I noticed it wasn't enough to help me survive there. Um, LA is filled with what I call turf. And you're looking at a little bit of the fake greenery here. It's super, super beautiful, but it's fraudulent. It's not real. And so everybody's acting. And so it, it requires a lot. Like even the, the, the churches I would try and visit there, it was like baby food. And I'm like, man, I'm young, but I'm older spiritually because I've matured in the faith. So anyway, I noticed I really started to lose myself. Like, as they say, you lose your soul. And I did. I started just kind of shifting away from who I was called to be and who I thought I was. And I was just lost. Um, and one particular day, I, I, was, um, I, just came, I had just finished Tiffany Haddish's um, Hollywood Confidential. We produced this event with my manager at the time. And we had a sit down. And I was like, we're going back and forth. And it was just time for me to go home. We weren't seeing eye to eye. And so I packed up my stuff. And the next morning, I took my three suitcases and came back home. So 2018 was a defining moment. I also lost the voice that year, by the way. I got a private audition for the voice. I flew, to, I, I missed my flight on purpose. <laughs> I missed my flight on purpose because I got so homesick. LA was just like a place of detriment. So I noticed all of these things were, were variables that were being put in place to push me closer to the father, closer to Elohim. And I got back home and I started this thing called mental detox because I had been looking into my childhood. I wanted to figure out like my attractions and why I liked what I liked and how, why I was the way I was, and my qualities and things that may be deemed like, I remember as a little boy, um, I'm, a, I'm a creative, I'm not really a sports person. I know we were kind of talking about Super Bowl, but we're not really 
that involved in sports, but um, I wasn't an athlete naturally. I played basketball and I played uh, baseball and stuff like that, but I wasn't natural at it. And my siblings were. Well, when we were younger, I don't know about you. You're just a few years younger than me. But when I was younger, it wasn't a creative age. Like if you didn't play sports, you were gay. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, what's going in between? What is creativity? Are you kidding me? You're singing in the choir? You're doing theater? Yeah. So I was that guy. So <laughs> I had all of these labels that were being assigned to me. And it took me a while. So 2018 was the year I really started to discover. I, I found out I was time traveling back to my eight-year-old self because it was a traumatic year for me. I'd experienced so much. I started preaching at that young age. So I stepped into a calling of mine. But at the same time, my grandmother passed away and I had to help her pick out her casket and no one knew that she was gonna die. It was so many different things that transpired, um, even from being touched at a young age, like that was a blur that you just kind of suppress and put away. So I learned 2018 was a, a learning gear about who I was, about what my soul had and the soul wounds that I carried. So I started Mental Detox um, and I, I named it Coffee and Chill. Inside of a coffee shop once a month, I gathered with friends and friends of their friends. And we basically did a non-traditional group therapy. I went to seminary school for counseling, um, but I needed more than that. I was like, y'all just giving us Bible scriptures <laughs> and that's great. But in the real world, they want more. They want practical tools. And so um, I started to just ask the father to put it together. And I remember the first session, there was there were two psych majors in the coffee shop. One was a, I want to say it was a Muslim, and I'm not sure what the other one was. And they stopped me outside when we were leaving. And one of the guys said, he was like, who are you studying? And I, and I was like, I, you know, I just, it's just kind of a mix of different things. And he was like, well, like you don't cite like your references. I was like, no, I'm not in school. Like I'm, I'm doing personal study. And he was like, I don't know how you're getting into all of this, but don't stop. And that was the moment for me where I was like, okay, if they could confirm it, not that I needed that validation, but sometimes we need that flesh and blood to come and say, hey, I see you. And that's really where it took off for me at that moment, where I fully embraced every level of thought that the father introduced me to, whether it was demonized, whether I felt I would be criticized, or whether I felt I would be condemned. I embraced it. I studied it for myself. I tried it. I knew I was divinely protected. And so that was really the start of me deconstructing my faith, shifting. I remember changing the name from Jesus, and I kept saying Yeshua in 2018 and 2019, trying to convince my mom, <laughs> you know, she's grown into it now. I remember saying, um, I remember, what was that? I, I, I started just shifting so many words because I realized a lot of our disconnection in the earth is semantics. It's just word choices. There's truth in everything, but we're saying it differently. We're speaking different languages. Tower of Babel, as an example, you know? Yeah. So I'm, that's the one thing I started to learn. And so that, oh, I know that was a lot, but, but that was really, that was the start of it. And yeah, the past few years have been something totally different. So I met you about a year ago, probably a little bit more than that. I don't remember, um, but I prophesied to you about doing that type of stuff. And I'm just now finding out how accurate I was when I said that that was part of your call and those having conversations and drawing audiences around topics that people avoid. I'm just now finding out that I was accurate. Right. You just kind of shook your head, grin and uh -huh. left. <laughs> yep. Yo, you were totally accurate. You were totally accurate. I remember that day. Um, you've been a key component in helping my family embrace another sense um because i feel like we learn in the church we definitely learn to hear from god sometimes we silence it by way of words or books um in the name of god but you helped us to activate our spiritual sight um and helping us to ascend um and not just even in heaven but understanding that heaven can be brought here and so I thank you for that. So I definitely remember that day because you were 
fire. My grandmother would t was telling me for months, you you need to meet this young guy. He's a grandmother says, you've got to meet this young guy, Apostle Nelson Castillo. He's powerful. He's creative. He's gifted. He ascends into heaven <laughs> anytime, all the time. I said, okay. So she kept telling me until that day come or came until that day came uh, where we were able to sit and fellowship with you and eat fruit and <laughs> vibrate at a high frequency and, and experience that ascend. <laughs> and uh, literally just from that one experience so i thank you for that i really do yeah i love doing that because it's so if we're talking about deconstruction there's no better way to destroy a lot of those constructs than to give you an experience that's contrary yeah if i tell you you can go to heaven now well it's up to if i can convince you with my words but if i you see me fighting with my hat <laughs> so if I if I then walk you through how to experience it and if I take you there and let you see it, then I just deconstructed several doctrines without ever having to do a word study or anything. No. Usually we're taught you can't go to heaven until you die. There's people on the flip end that is like, oh, heaven's just a state of consciousness. It's when you're living from a high level. Hell is when you live low. Well, that's also false, but until I can show you, it's right. just theology, it's just philosophy. All of that gets broken down when you're walking around and you get to see and you're like, okay, this isn't just a state of consciousness. <laughs> right. Hey, look, I don't have to die to be here. It's wow. not hard to do. <laughs> At all. <laughs> I, should, I, I should always be here. I should visit here more often. Yeah is what it turns into. And you get to watch layers after layer of deception come apart and I don't have to be anyone's enemy. As in, it's not, oh, such and such told me this. No, I was there myself. I saw it. I was there. It, I experienced it. I remember, I want to say one of the things that you experienced your first time there was you received an impartation and kind of began to get a download on the science of healing. Yes. So, See, I, I, I do them a lot, but I try. I have a decent memory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As you should. You know all things. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But, yeah, so talk about, see, I haven't really gotten to talk to you much since that day. So how has that really gone into your regular life after this? What does your spiritual walk look like now? Sure. Well, I, I think... Um, Ascending has just become a, a part of my life. Um, I don't necessarily even have to close my eyes to do it. Um, I just see. Um, I just I just see. It's, it's as simple as opening your eyes. And so, uh, as I said before, I you helped us activate another sense um, spiritually. And so we're not just hearing, but we're, we're seeing. And so as a prophet, of which we all are called to be, and I've walked in that, you know, just in that, uh, that anointing and that power since I was a very small child. Um, it has really just enabled me to see beyond where I'm standing. Like I can, I can exit this one moment and see. And so it could be like I was in, I was in worship the other day in a traditional service and which has been a, I will say this, <laughs> since ascending and since coming into another level of divine truth in terms of consciousness, it's, it's been extremely conflicting to have to serve in a traditional system. Um, but at the same time, I understand why I'm there because I'm able to teach like our team of leaders on sonship and how to um, exit the the prison of religion and so at, at the same time it's also been a challenge where i'm like man it's so much this truth and you see all the manipulation and everything so it's it's i don't call it a con but there it's definitely come with a challenge to embrace that level of divine truth and and still have to see what's around you and it's like ah i want to be able to change it in an instant but um overall it's it's changed my life for the better because i can trust 
I can trust. Having another sense makes you a greater person. You know, I think about being a, a natural person. For a person that can see but, but can't hear, they're limited. For a person that can hear but can't see, they're limited. But if I can have all of my senses, my touch, my, and I love that you activated that for us, that we can use every sense. And since I was a little boy, I used to ask my mom, can you, I, we would be in churches. I would say, can you smell what I'm smelling? Because I would literally smell a foul odor. So it's, it's, it has improved my life. It has activated me. It's affirmed me. And it's caused me to trust I am and to be that expression in the earth, to know that I am the Christ of God, that I am that I am, and that he's using me to live out and experience what life looks like as Brandon. And I get to have fun doing it. <laughs> it's as yeah. as that. It's fun. Because one of the things that I love that you mentioned is that, well, I was told that this thing was demonic. This is witchcraft. Yet, I see the majority of it in the system that told me it was witchcraft when we're talking about hypnosis. Now, hypnosis is an area that I've refused to study just so that I can honestly say I've never studied it. Because I lead, I lead oftentimes with spiritual experiences. So I want to be able to honestly say, oh, I've never studied it. Right. Yeah. Because I do a lot of things that people can uh, can easily say, oh, it's placebo. Oh, it's mind games. It's hypnosis. Yeah. If I've never studied it and I could take a lie detector, I could take a lie detector test. And yeah, I've never studied it. Yeah. Yet the experiences continue. I'm a, bit, I'm a bit more comfortable in that. Not because it hasn't intrigued me, because I've always wondered, okay, I know how I do what I do, but how do they do what they do? Yeah. Like, I remember, um, and I've had this conversation slash debate because I'm having a conversation. Other people end up debating because I don't argue with anybody, but uh, about people getting slain in the spirit, where there's one group that's like, yeah, this is of God. And then there's another group that's like, nope, it began with uh, Franz Mesmer, where we get the term mesmerizing from. Uh, and it was a form of hypnosis that was being used on the people. And Mariah Woodworth Etter was the catalyst that brought that into Christianity. Now, I'm a historian as well. That's not true. People have been falling for centuries. <laughs> People have right. been falling for, for, for millennia. It's always been a thing. But people will create a history to fit the narrative they have. They'll create facts that don't exist to fit what they believe. Uh, and like that was one of them. It's like, well, how can Mariah Eder be the one to introduce it when John Wesley was doing that about 200 years before her? Wow. And then George Fox 100 years before him. There's nothing new under the sun. Charles Finney, a hundred years before Mariah Eder. Wow. How can she be the one to introduce it? it? Yeah. And for one, Franz Mesmer was in a completely different region. A hundred years apart. <laughs> wow. She didn't travel until towards the end of her ministry and she never went there. <laughs> It's not like today where we have the internet and anything that's come out, we have access to. Yeah. It's like, no, we're talking late 1800s, early 1900s. The radio was prophesied and manifested in that time period. Wow. They just got the radio. <laughs> Frequency. Wow. So awesome. books and textbooks like that from other countries, that's not common. That's not a thing. <laughs> yeah. But just thinking about the mental gymnastics that happen in that structure, like uh, one of my mentors, I consider him a mentor, Bobby Haru. I've had him on the show before. One of the things that I found funny is he grew up in the church and he would talk about the chakra system. And he would say that the church would intentionally use certain frequencies and sounds to manipulate people's pineal gland to get a certain reaction out of them. I grew up in church myself. I know exactly what he's talking about. Mind you play control. certain chords to get the fast and happy. If you want people to shout and run around, you play shout and run around music. They'll yeah. do it regardless. 
<laughs> you want people to start crying? Hey, you just play the right song. <laughs> so it's great seeing that you've been able to uncover that for yourself, being able yeah. to label it for what it is and still find a way to work through the system. Cause I wouldn't even consider working with the system or working through the system to affect and bring something new to the table. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So because I don't want to study hypnosis, as I described, I'm not going to ask you about that today. <laughs> well, see, I didn't even study. I, I didn't <laughs> study. What I did was I really just looked up a lot of different things when it came to the mind. Because when, when I developed mental detox, that wasn't until a few years later. So I started studying a lot in, in psychology. Um, and Dr. Sutton really helped me kind of dive into that as well. Um, but mental detox, I co-mixed psychology, neuroscience, and faith together. So whatever I wanted to study spiritually, like I would go find and attach a metaphysical truth to it yeah. and say, wow, well, what you gonna do now? I would go find a law of the universe. Like, and I started even preaching that way, like if I, in the traditional church system, where I would be introducing <laughs> laws of the universe and say, well, you're, you're connected to everything. So how can you demonize stuff when that's you? That's you in another reality. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. So talk to me about meditation. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so, well, um, conscious breath work. My, my, I feel my meditation is, um, it's a conglomerate of things now because when you when you can ascend, when you know how to breathe, when you know how to focus and you're creative, you can do anything. So meditation has really just become a, a time for me to create, I'll be honest with you. Um, for instance, the other day I was meditating and I, um, the father told me to create doors. So I, <laughs> I was actually in a worship service. So he said like build doors. So I'm, you, I use my actual hands because like I love energy work. So I'm um, building the doors, you know, the hinges, screwing, like I'm, I'm doing it all literally with my hands and with my, um, my creative power. I put the doorknobs on them and I put the key and the father told me to label each door. And so I built the doors and I labeled each door. The one I think I named contracts. Um, another one I, I probably uh, named sync placements for uh, soundtracks for my music. And so, and I have maybe like four different doors. And so the father said, take the keys and put them in your pocket. So I'm in the service while people are doing the traditional time of prayer, you know, mustering up whatever they need to. And so I put the keys in my pocket. And so the father said, you just created doors of opportunity for yourself. So these are the doors that you'll be able to walk through when you're ready, unlock them. So meditation has become a time for me to create. It's not necessarily a time for me to exit anymore. Um, I've just come, I've grown to a place or ascended into a place um, where I can just use my power and, and live in that time. And in the event that I need to just exit to calm my mind, I can do that. Whether it's, it's tapping or just breathing or or just exercising my my visualization, I could do that. But it's really become a, a time to create, a, a, a time to create art in the earth. In okay. The so uh, you may have heard me talk about it. I know I've written about it in my book. I've taught on it a bunch, but puzzle pieces. And you kind of started talking about that a bit when you were saying that a lot of things are the same and we're fighting over the vocabulary. Yeah. What have been some areas of spirituality that you've begun to embrace from whatever culture that you can say is this is a part of my kingdom walk now that had I stuck to the faction wars, I wouldn't be moving in this. I wouldn't be functioning in this, but it's safe because God showed me it was safe. Yeah, sure. Um, I would say, well, a, a lot of the meditation, which was rooted in a lot of um, Indian teachings, uh, you know, our Eastern medicine and 
Ayurveda, um, studying some of those texts to see how they align and they speak the same truths. So I would say applying a lot of that understanding about the mind has helped me to embrace my identity and my divinity more and just seeing everyone as myself, like even people in another religious construct, seeing them as myself in another reality has helped me embrace the fact that it's okay. Like it's yours. I'm divinely protected. I know that for sure. So the father already knows not to expose me to anything. And I trust myself not to expose myself to anything that's going to be harmful to me. I've got an intuition that will tell me otherwise, you know? And so, um, I just, I've learned to, to not live in fear of the unknown anymore. Embrace the unknown and know that you're divinely protected because of who you carry and because of what's running in your blood. So yeah, I would definitely say learning from the um, Indian culture. Um, I'm still embracing other schools of thought in terms of, uh, I know you're a scholar. <laughs> the way your mind works is so brilliant. Um, but also studying within myself has been a different thing. My cousin recently asked me, he was like, do you read a lot? I said, no, I don't read as much as I used to um, because I learned to just study within and what I'll do when I do study is to confirm what I just taught myself. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The That's more so what I do. I have a library full of books. Like I have a large bookshelf. A decent portion of those books I haven't read yet just because some of them I got just for clout. Just to say that I got them. I like Not that them. I wanted to learn anything from them. That's right. You got to have them. Like, oh, yeah, I have that. The library. Because <laughs> sometimes it disarms people enough for me to have a conversation. Because wow. I, I talk to people that Christians scare off. That's what my yeah. whole show is, is talking to people that have otherwise wouldn't be heard. So sure. some of that is being able to disarm someone so that y'all can have a regular conversation. It's like, well, have you read this? I have it. And they leave me alone enough for us to talk. Yeah. It's like, oh, I started on it. I've been through, I, I've uh, skimmed through it a little bit, but I haven't finished. Some books I have, but majority of what I learned and what I go by isn't from anything I've read. It's things that I've encountered in the spirit world that I later found out that there are books that talk about this. Like for me, it was the Tao Te Ching maybe a year ago where I was like, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that this book was sitting here all this time and no one told me I would I should have been read this. Yeah. Or like the Emerald Tablets or uh, some of the different comedic texts where I'm like, wow, this has been here all this time and no one was going to tell us. You wanted us to reread Matthew, Mark, Luke and John we when the Gospel of the Holy Twelve was right there. <laughs> Gospel of Philip is right there, and we're rereading Psalms. Man, <laughs> what a limited truth! <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I, I consider myself a backward scholar in that I learn from inside and then kind of do research and see if anyone else found it outside. <laughs> I love that, I love that, and that's how we should live. So <clears throat> talk about, because while the majority is internal work, what have been some books that you found that do carry some of the things that you've learned in the kingdom where you've I'm been just... able to go on your own and say, oh, God taught me that and it's here. So I missed the first part of what you said. Okay. I was just saying, um, what have been some books that you've come across where while reading them, you realize, wait, this is something God told me. And it's here in this place. That's not the Bible. Hmm. I'd have to pinpoint, you know, it, it populates organically. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not even necessarily by the book. It may be a person that says it. It may be a post that I'll see that I'll just get a, it may be on Facebook that a whole con uh, confirmation will come to me. And I'm just like, okay. 
Okay, I, I am hearing. Um, and now I just take it as a as an encouragement. <laughs> so the, the father used someone in a whole other country to create a, a promo just to just to confirm my faith and my gift. Um, so yeah, it, it really just happens. Like I, I recently had a friend that was asking me um, to she's kind of exiting the traditional the traditionalism of uh, what she's been trained up in as in terms of what Christianity was taught, uh, has taught her. And so I, she's saying like, where do I start? Where do I start? Like, and I told her, to be honest with you, you just start within yourself. It's not necessarily something you should be chasing to go read. And I didn't want to send her to a whole bunch of, you know, just send her a whole bunch of jargon because I think we get really dependent on that. And you, you know, you, you don't trust you you don't trust you and if i don't trust me i can't trust yahweh because i'm created in his likeness and image so if i don't trust his likeness and his image then i'll follow any strange voice and so um i say that to say i really feel like life will come to confirm life will show up to confirm truth in your life you don't have to fight for truth it populates with or without your belief it's going to come to you so if you just if you want it Allow it to manifest and allow allow the earth to respond to that truth in your life. It'll come to validate it. You won't need it by man. It will come by itself in some way, some form, by way of a billboard, by way of a voice, by a radio ad, by a Facebook post. It'll come to confirm the truth. Okay. So uh, you're a musician, as you said, you're a singer, an artist. As your spiritual journey changed, has your music also changed? Like for me, there's certain songs that I don't listen to anymore just because they don't match sure. where I'm at anymore. Um, do you still sing older songs? Do you sing new only? Have you learned? Have you? Do you tweak some of the lyrics and still sing? Uh, have you learned how to impart using your voice? Sure. What is that like for you now? Yeah. So um, some songs, if I can shy away from them, I will. Uh, songs that have Jesus, I genuinely will translate to Yeshua as an ad lib if I have to. Um, but I don't fight it too much. Uh, again, I just kind of allow it to be organic. In terms of my own personal music, I I feel that I started off writing, like my first song wasn't a gospel song. It was a jazz song. Um, and that was a very big decision for me to make that I, I won't say I even wrestled with it, but it was a conversation that I had with the father. Like, hey, should I be, everybody knows me as a worship leader. Should I be starting this way? So all of the music that I have out, I have two EPs and probably five singles. None of them are gospel, um, but there's a frequency to what I've written and the lyrical content is divine. And so I've been able to trust um, that my impartation into the industry of music and into the sound and frequency it's very particular and it, it's not gonna be the same. Um, so I won't say it's changed as so much, but I have come to trust myself more with my pen, with my writing, and even with my worship. Um, when I do lead, I'm intentional about it. I'm intentional about if like um, the father took me, and I'll say this, something came to confirm this, uh, about two months for me. I ascended. I was I was standing in service and the father took me on a mountain. I'm standing on top of this mountain and it's like the Grand Canyon or something. It's huge. And there's land and it's beauty and it's water and it's everything. And the father said, this is where you're reigning from. This is where your domain is. And this is where the worship. So I started seeing all of our worship team leaders walking into that domain. So the father said to minister from this place. So that was a, a big revelation for me um, in my worship that I had to worship from a certain position. I couldn't just worship from anywhere. There's a certain space that I have to be at um, spiritually and naturally to envision myself there, to visualize and to know where I am. So there's an actual location that I worship from now that I never knew I needed to or existed. And it helps me to walk 
and a greater um, a greater understanding of what we're doing and a much greater boldness. Yeah, so I hope that answers the question. So yeah, it, it definitely has affected me positively. Yeah, and something, I don't know if you know this already, I don't know if you've heard me say this or read the articles I put out about it, but the soundtrack of God's government is jazz. <laughs> yes, yes. And that was like, that's, that's, what, that's exactly what I'm talking about. The confirmation comes naturally, organically. When you, when you've said that, because it had to be, I want to almost say two years ago. I yeah. think my, my grandmother and my mom both touched me and they were like, listen to this now. I think it was a sound recording or something. And, um, and it talked about that. And it just came to affirm like, Brandon, you're safe. Follow your intuition. It's like, oh, yeah. it's okay for me to do jazz. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> yes, even, even what they consider contemporary gospel music or like, well, not contemporary, but the old school gospel music was jazz. It was the blues. They just changed the lyrics to be about God. <laughs> Definitely. So yeah. those older hymns, those older songs that we fell in love with that had such a powerful impact, it was jazz. Yeah. They put a lot of grief and sorrow into it, but it was still jazz. But like right now, what we're experiencing are kingdom artists that are infusing jazz music, which is a technology of its own. With the revelation that they're carrying, the impartation of things that they've experienced. Because jazz music, more than any other, is impartations. Yeah. The chords, the way that it's structured, it bypasses defense. All the bodily defenses a person has, it targets right wherever it wants to. It's like if Mike Tyson was a ghost and you had the boxing where he could hit you and ain't nothing you could do to defend yourself. Exactly. That's how jazz music is. And there's a few different uh, kingdom artists that I know and all of them are being drawn to the same sound. I've had to tell them all this. You're being drawn to jazz because that's what the kingdom sounds like. That's the soundtrack for for not just the time that we're in, but eternally, that's what it's always sounded like. Wow. <laughs> that you notice music always evolves into jazz, evolves from jazz, and then goes right back to it. <laughs> wow. Wow. What a thought. What a revelation. I, I, I agree with you. I, I, when I think about jazz, the inflections, it is a... Uh, it is a, a dance. It, just as you said, I, I'm getting a visual of how it can, the frequency will shift to get to wherever it needs to. And uh, I think about the young lady, Samara Joy. I think she just got another Grammy and she came on the scene. This girl was, she's in her early twenties and she came out doing jazz loudly like in a time where jazz music is just not really a thing it's more of an underground genre for but it's not really publicized on the main stage if you know what i'm saying and she did it and succeeded quickly and and, and people embraced it so i think it just goes to affirm what you're saying that it, it certainly is uh the soundtrack is certainly has a frequency of its own and it's doing a, a really incredible work i'm just really excited to be able to embrace yeah. it now me and you were supposed to collab forever ago on a on a topic and i'm realizing we're finna go into it now okay but we're talking about fiction and the way that the kingdom will reveal itself through fiction and through movies and cartoons and stuff just going with this topic did you notice that when disney did a uh a movie about the soul they chose jazz to be the soundtrack yes <laughs> yes wow they did. They did. I've been saying forever they prophesied better than us all. <laughs> yeah, there's there's an anointing. <laughs> there's an anointing there with Disney. Film and television in general, whether positive or negative, they can they can release a lot into the earth. Yeah. So so let's nerd out for a moment. What's some of the let, let's start off with movies. What are some movies where you've been able to extract some some kingdom truth out of? Oh man, I'll be honest, every movie I watch, <laughs> I'm a pantheist. I get a, I get a revelation out of everything. And you know, 
let's start easy. Let's start with Lion King because that's everybody's favorite. <laughs> Lion King. Um, oh, well, you have the son who becomes the savior, so you know that's an easy thing. Um, the sacrifice. Hmm. Like even in talking about like faith and being comfortable in our relationship with the father, yeah. something that was subtle was the fact that Simba woke his dad up, the king of the whole world, up so he could get some water. OK, I see where you're going here. Talk about comfortability. Let's talk about not having an evil father that's waiting to destroy us. Jeez. <laughs> How about the fact that <laughs> the riches, the wealth, the glory was following Simba the whole movie and it traveled with him. Pride Rock in the Savannah didn't decay because Scar was on the throne. No, the rightful king was in the wrong spot. Therefore, the wealth wasn't there. Wow. <laughs> Running from the wrong place. That's powerful. You about to make me go rewatch Lion King. <laughs> Talk about remember who you are. They look. He looks in the mirror and sees Definitely the father. That. Definitely that your divinity. Your you mean father. when I see you, I should see the father, or yeah. when you see me, you see the father. See the wow, father. I am that I am. Come on, that's so good. You know, I. Pretty much most of what I do is the same thing Rafiki does, which is just uh, hit people with sticks and remind them <laughs> of their kingdom identity. Oh, Literally, it's, it's, it's kingdom identity. You're trying to hide and you have a throne to rule from. I love that. Yeah, okay. out. Lion King has to be one of your favorites. Not even. I just watched it a lot as a kid, so I got good memory. You know, okay. that, I got it. As a kid, I just watched the same movie on repeat. I got you. <laughs> Like Kung Fu Panda, the one, two, and three is about the body, the soul, and the spirit in order. <laughs> wow. What's the solution to the first one? His body is literally what protects him from Tai Lung. Hey, if y'all ain't seen these movies, skip this part. Uh, his body is literally go back. <laughs> what protects him from Tai Lung because he used that nerve attack where he hits him. And it shuts down all their nerves and they can't move. Well, he too fat for him to hit his nerves. They showed <laughs> that when they was doing acupuncture. They was like, it's hard to get. I got to move through all this fur and all this fat. It's hard to get to your nerves. Oh, my goodness. His body ended up being the solution. It was all about taking pride in who you are physically. We get to the second movie. <laughs> We get to the second movie. It's all about overcoming emotional damage, soulish trauma. Well, that's all the soul. How did he how did he overcome? He stepped into enlightenment, which is all about the soul being clear from his filters. Man. The soul no longer in the way. They called it inner peace. <laughs> we get to the third movie, and it's all about engaging the spirit world, traveling to and fro, <laughs> and dealing with high level spiritual things were the only thing that can propel your spirit and awaken your spirit is your identity. They tied the identity movie into the spirit movie because the real you is spiritual. <laughs> wow. The power of animation. You know, I did a post on Tangled uh, a year ago. So I blame everybody who knew about that post for not reminding me to make more. Y'all let me go a year without doing another oh, Kingdom wow. movie series. So that's everyone else's fault. I won't take accountability for that one. Nah. <laughs> so look, we've got a, the next movie. We've got to select it, pick it, and then do a, a special on it so we can come and talk about it. Cause Yeah, I got to get you back just to nerd out. <laughs> for sure. For but sure. if y'all ain't seen that post, it's on Facebook where I break down Tangled. Pretty much it's the journey we all go through of leaving our religion. Mm. Predominantly, if you in the States, you started off Christian. And they do a good job of showing the, the breakthrough from going from church to kingdom. Very literally. Wow. Where all the gifts that she had was used within that tiny building. In reality, she was the offspring of royalty that was looking for her and waiting for her to come home to rule and reign where she belonged. 
<laughs> the anointing she had from birth being used to keep her captor alive, which was actually meant to benefit the whole world. Mm. <laughs> Talk about signs in the stars. Her birthday, she'd look out the window and know when her birthday was because them lanterns pass, which means we oftentimes overlook signs and wonders just because we didn't know who we were. <laughs> exactly i go more in depth on facebook that's the that's the only facebook plug i ever did because <laughs> most people know me from facebook i love it i love it but yeah we definitely got to get we definitely got to get you back hey y'all watching this leave some movies in the comments so me and brandon can come back and talk about oh, all these movies <laughs> See, and the thing is i gotta get on because i don't think i've paid as much attention to animated films like I generally just regular, like it could be regular show, regular movie. I just see so many spiritual themes and revelations. But no, definitely tell them to drop those movies. Drop yeah. those movies. Shoot, talking regular movies. The Woman King came out, showing us oh. that there's a masculine and a feminine balance Come that on. we have a father and a mother that it rules our government. It takes both to tango. <laughs> And they worried about historical accuracy. <laughs> Jeez. No, that, that was a powerful movie. <laughs> and yeah, it's, they... it's the specific lines that hold so much truth. Man. Yeah, we definitely got to do it. We got to do it. We, we can pick the genre and then pick a movie. Shoot. Hopefully they fill this comment section full of movies and we just going to look at the list and nod our head and say, all right. <laughs> we'll try that out. We'll try that out. I love it. So look, we getting ready to close and I don't want to keep you too long because I haven't eaten today. But so you don't um, want to keep you long, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so no, I kind of just want to open up the floor for you to kind of just pour into the audience. Sure. And just give some last bits of advice, some wisdom, and just kind of share your spirit with the audience. Okay, sure. Um, so I would just say to you to embrace your identity, to be who you're called to be. Embrace every part of you. Don't don't fold at the parts that you think are unnecessary or even the parts that don't make sense. Um, I remember trying to pick who I was going to be <laughs> instead of just being. You know, as young people were really taught, to have a role model or a mentor and those things are great it helps us it helps us to create a goal for ourselves um but don't limit yourself based on what you see create what you want to see and and trust yourself in that know that you are divinely protected that you're chosen that every inhale and exhale is a reminder that yahweh has not forgotten you you could have taken your last breath last night you could you probably did and it was his breath that made you a living soul so every morning, no, every inhale, every exhale is a reminder that there's still purpose, there's still a destiny, there's still a need for me, that my bloodline has waited on me. Doesn't matter what was done before I got here, doesn't matter what family I was born into, what neighborhood I was brought up in, what situation or circumstance I was birthed in. I am created in the likeness and the image of my father. I am the Christ of God. So be that, exist in it, trust it, know it. Let God be in you and let God have fun through you. Fun, wealth, and worship have the same frequency. When you do them, the Father gets the glory. He'll do it. I am that I am. And so are you. Yeah. It was C.S. Lewis that said that joy is the serious business of heaven. <laughs> wow. No wonder it can be our strength. Wow. So let's see, where can people connect with you? Where can people find your music, partner with you, all that stuff? All platforms, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Brandon J. Marks. And uh, on all music platforms from Apple Music to uh, Spotify to Tidal, Brandon J. Marks, YouTube, Brandon J. Marks. It's all my name. Connect with me. Let's be friends. Let's grow together. Let's have fun. Cool. So um, just in closing, could you pray for the audience? Sure. Okay. Um, I have this uh, revelation, this idea, um, the transliteration of uh, prayer 
is to capture the thought of the father or to set a trap to capture the thoughts of the father. So I pray a little differently, but I will pray to affirm who you are in the father. So father, I thank you that I am the Christ of God. I thank you that the person that is hearing this frequency would embrace their identity, their divinity to be the Christ of God, to know that in you, they have and live and move and have their being. Thank you for all that you've called them to be. And thank you for being them, that we are one divinely connected in Yahushua's name. Amen. It's awesome. Brandon, thank you for joining me here. It My took forever apology. to get you on, but I'm glad you're finally here. <laughs> it was the right time and it's Black History Month, so I feel honored. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Shoot, I forgot to even talk about Black History. That's an episode in itself. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, man. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to all that we'll be able to do in the future and collaborate and have fun. Awesome. Y'all, well, this concludes this episode of The Inner. Until next time, y'all be blessed.